Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Vega. I am an application engineer here at uh, Go Engineer, and today we're going to talk about um, structural analysis, an introduction on uh, how we can use SimExpress and Simulation Standard to evaluate some uh, some of your parts. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. So overall, what we want to do is show you guys uh, what Simulation Express is and also reveal to you the fact that it's actually a feature that has been available uh, for quite some for quite some while. So if you have any SOLIDWORKS license for CAD, including SOLIDWORKS standard, you can actually utilize Simulation Express. It's going to be a, a um, first pass simulation tool so that you can actually evaluate the FEA analysis on a part. So it also allows you to output uh, material that you're going to be able to share with uh, your customers, um, including um, a SOLIDWORKS, uh, sorry, a Word report and also an e-drawings file, which non-CAD non users can actually utilize. Um, if you guys are just uh, coming in, please uh, keep in mind to ask any questions. Uh, go ahead and not use. Let's not use the chat. Utilize the Q and A section of Zoom to ask your questions. Okay. So to be able to enable Simulation Express, you'll want to go to your Evaluate tab, and then you'll see on the further right you'll have that option for Simulation Express. Uh, what is it, or what is it good for? So let's say you have a customer that comes up to you with a cast. Um, angle bracket like this one it's cracked and so they want you to actually make a new one um, and you're not going to make a cast piece yourself so instead you're going to utilize the existing stock that you have in your shop and then just make it out of something that well you could weld together and uh, cut out and have ready pretty quickly so the biggest question here would be well what are the dimensions that you would need for this to be able to withstand the um, the pressures and loads that the old angle bracket could. So how do we answer the question? That's where SimExpress comes in. So with SimExpress you can very quickly, just within a few minutes, find out the performance of uh, your part. So in this case, for this angle bracket, assuming that it's made with a cast, uh, cast carbon steel, uh, we end up finding a maximum stress of about 5200 psi and a displacement of one tenth thousand. So, um, we go back to SolarWorks and utilize the existing geometry of the angle bracket to get the positioning of the holes that we want and then have our geometry ready for testing. Again, just in a couple of minutes, we can very quickly get uh, results out of this part. Now, in this case, I'm seeing that the maximum stresses of my welded bracket is about 8200 psi and 310,000 in displacement. So, the biggest question here would be, can this actually, is this a good piece to use? Uh, maybe we, don't t we need to reinforce it. Uh, do we just change the, the dimensions of the gusset? Or do we double the gussets? Well, we can test that awfully quick, adding two gussets to both ends, and then running it through Simulation Express. And we end up finding that just adding the two gussets give it, gives us a maximum stress of 7,800 and a displacement of only two ten thousands. Now, you might want to ask your, uh, your customer to see if this is acceptable or is within what they're hoping to do. Um, but very quickly, you can evaluate what your decision is going to be. Right? You're no longer guessing about uh, maybe making it bigger here, maybe making it thicker there. You can actually have tangible data to know if it's right or not. And once you're done, what good are results for you if you cannot actually share that with your customer? So Simulation Express allows you to output an e-drawings file and a Word document with all the relevant data so they can view it in their computers, regardless of them having SOLIDWORKS or not. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what that looks like in SOLIDWORKS. So here's the angle bracket that we have. 
let's go ahead and then utilize uh, Simulation Express. So I'll go to Evaluate, Simulation Express. Now do note, when you first click this, you're going to be asked to activate the product. To do that, you're going to have to log into MySolarWorks.com. Just follow the instructions that will come up in your prompt. Um, you just need to have a login for SolarWorks. So I'll go ahead and then start a new study here. I have the ability to add fixtures, meaning faces that I'm not going to allow to move. So I want to go ahead and then select these bolt holes to be uh, to be rigid. Then accept this. Go to our next step. And if you'll note right here on the upper right, on the right task pane, we can actually see the steps that it takes to go through. Next, we'll add a force. Now in this case, our customer told us that this is supposed to be under 1,200 or yeah, 1,200 uh, pounds of force. Next, I'll assign the material. In 2020, we actually have these new uh, material search boxes. Awfully handy. You just type the material that you want, and the results come up. Okay. Once I'm I'm ready there, um, I do have the ability to change the mesh density of this part. If I click Change Settings and Change Mesh Density. I could um, use this slider or I can actually decide a, a finite size for the elements in here. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it in course for this study. So it meshes the part and now let's run the simulation. So very quickly that was done. And it starts by showing you a simulation or a, uh, an animation of the deformation. So you have an idea if your setup was correct. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop that and go to the next step. Now we can see the maximum stresses found in this part. Okay, so we can see that the max is actually found where the bolts are going to be uh, stiffening those, uh, those holes. We can also see the maximum displacement found, and this is here is that three ten thousandths. We can even display the safety factor on this part. Now this is showing anything uh, that's one or less in red. So this is telling me that this part is safe. It's not reaching yield. In fact, if we go to, let's say, six, we start seeing a bit of, a, of an area where the safety factor is, is um, six or less. OK, so essentially, we're done here. So now I click uh, Done with Results. I can generate an e-drawings file. Just choose anywhere to save it. And it creates a result file that you can see in e-drawings. And keep in mind, e-drawings viewer is a read-only application, but it's free. Anybody can install it on their computer, and uh, they, they just do a Google search for it, and they got it. Next, we can actually output a report. Once we click Generate Report, uh, it'll utilize a template that you can actually modify either prior to having it be created or after it's been created. And since it's just a Word document, you can send it to whoever you like. They could even open that in OpenOffice, even if they don't have Word. And this report is going to be awfully detailed. It's going to contain quite a bit of information regarding material properties, uh, the mesh of the part, part setup, and the results. So just very quickly going through it. There's the part, material properties, how it was set up, right, what faces were um, loaded, and the mesh, and the result further down. You know, you can send this to whoever you, you like. Everybody has words nowadays, for the most part. Okay, let's go back here. So, um, some of you may have noticed that the, um, the part that I did was actually a single body part. It was all just a single part that was combined into one individual body, instead of the three pieces that the gusset would be. So this is where we start getting into the limitations that that uh, Simulation Express can get to. So how do we get around that? This is where Simulation Standard comes in. So naturally, there, it being a free software, uh, there will be a couple of limitations, right? And so if you're trying to do multiple bodies and assign different materials to them, um, control the mesh density, 
or even do no penetration contact so you can get uh, body to body um, pressure responses uh, you're going to need to have simulation, uh, simulation standard. Now there's a couple of other features like the trend tracker and fatigue analysis and kinematic motion. Um, I'll go ahead and show you a couple of those later on here. So do keep in mind SOLIDWORKS simulation is an entire suite that contains quite a few other features. Okay, today we are just concentrating on simulation standard. Okay, this is just the just the initial uh, tier of the simulation suite that we have. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, let's go ahead and take a look at what that piece, right, that three uh, or that three component part uh, would look like when it's studied in simulation standard. All right, so as you see here, ooh. <laughs> uh, here is that part with the gusset. All right, first I'm going to enable um, the simulation add-in right there. Now, um, a little tip for you is if you guys end up getting a simulation license, I would recommend it be a network license if you have more than one user. That way you could have a team of two, three, or 10 people all be able to do simulation just one at a time, or at least for as many licenses as you have. Then, then the license is not locked on just one single computer. Okay, so let's go ahead and start the study. I'll go to my simulation tab here, new study, and I'll create a static study. And here we have our feature tree. So first, we know that we actually have the three different components and they're not all put together. So we can actually just tell each one of them to be different materials if we desire to do so. So I'll just right click this here and uh, you have the ability to, to add your own favorite materials. I've done so here with um, cast carbon steel. So I can just click that, all my materials are set. And now, if you if you were to be studying this part, okay, we have some tools um, in simulation standard like contact visualization plot, which will allow you to see what faces are essentially glued together. Okay, so in simulation standard, you can actually study not just assemblies but also multi-body parts. Okay, it doesn't matter what environment you're in. Simulation is just it's it's going to be able to work with the multiple bodies that exist. Here with this little legend, we can see what faces are considered to be glued together. And if you were to weld this, well, good luck finding a welder that can somehow manage to do that, right? A whole a whole entire face. So we know this is not exactly the most accurate representation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the global contact on this body to tell it that these bodies are all having uh, no penetration. This means that there's going to be interaction between each body. If I look at my contact visualization plot, I see that now in another, uh, in my other legend, my new legend, I show no penetration. Now, to be able to represent the welding a little more accurately, I'm going to go ahead and click contact set, and I'm going to add a bonded contact. What this is going to do is it's going to essentially glue together particular entities of interest. In this case, I'm going to choose this edge, that edge, and then this face. So this is going to represent a weld bead going through these areas and just those areas alone. Okay, I'll do the same on the bottom part of the gusset. Oh, let's go back to contact set, bonded. Okay. And then uh, let's say we want to weld the back of this piece, uh, not necessarily the, the front of it, because we might not have enough space. Okay, I'll just do that face and this one. And now we can review the results in the contact visualization plot. Click calculate. And so we can very clearly see that the edges are what is welded. 
and the faces in, that are going to be interacting are recognized as as, uh, as such that they will be push against, pushing against each other. Now let's go ahead and then add fixtures. So what I'm going to do is instead of just using a fixed geometry, which is what I was limited to in uh, Simulation Express, I want to use advanced fixtures. Here I have quite a few different options where I can I can constrain um, the individual six degrees of freedom of each entity I choose. What I want to do is choose these two, and I'm not going to allow it to move actually nor outwards. Okay. Now, just to match the, um, in this case, let's say we were having shoulder bolts. These faces are actually going to be in contact, which is making me assume that these are rigid. If were I to put a regular thread, I might not want to uh, constrain the circular face. Instead, the outer faces where the pressure goes um, for the bolts. Okay, I'll do the same on these on these other two faces, just so that we can match the simulation express study. Okay, once we do that, one thing that we have, um, one of the other features that we have is we have quite a few different loads that we can add in simulation standard. Force, pressure, torque, gravity. It, we can even add a prescribed displacement. So if we actually know how how far a piece should move or should deflect, we will be able to find the resultant forces and stresses from that deflection. So to match the study, I'm just going to go ahead and put a force of 1,200 pounds there. Now. When it comes to the world of FEA, you actually want to concentrate your uh, your mesh in particular areas of interest. In this case, because we saw that the areas of high stress were around these uh, bolts, I'm going to go ahead and add mesh constraint. Oh, sorry, mesh uh, mesh refinement on these areas, just so I don't have to increase the um, the mesh density of my entire model. This way, I only I only do that on the areas that matter. Because the higher the mesh, the more time you're going to spend waiting for the for the problem to solve. And you can see now, I have a lot more mesh concentration in those areas of interest with high stress, and I don't have to have that higher mesh density elsewhere. In simulation um, simulation express, you would have actually had to increase the mesh density for the entire part, you know, and that would cause that would uh, mean that you would unnecessarily spend time waiting for the calculation to finish instead of just getting to your results as quickly as you can all right there we go now in simulation standard you can also look at the mesh of your results as you see the as you see the uh, the results now notice that in this case if i do an animation here i'm not going to get a massive deformation on this part this is because i have the freedom to control the deformation scale that i get this here, it's great to see where the stresses are happening, but sometimes for us to be able to understand what's really happening on the part, um, this is why we add the deformation scale. You can either let SOLIDWORKS use its own automatic one, or you can add one of your own. So now that I have this deformation of, eight, of uh, 800, I can actually see that these components were, were uh, separating a bit. Right? If I click Animate, I can see that very exaggerated the formation of each one of the parts and you can even see see where the contact points are occurring amongst these parts so if I go ahead and hide the gusset I can see how the areas uh, where the gusset was making contact are not are not in a high stress as the sides I can even control my legend here so I can actually see some of the um, some of the stresses a little more clearly and in fact, because my yield strength for steel is 35 or 36,000 uh, 36, PSI, I'm well within my uh, safety factors. Now, another one of the great tools of simulation standard is we have the trend tracker. What this does is this will actually cha uh, save the different, um, different settings that you have changed in your study and model so that you can make sure that you're achieving the goal in your simulation study. So let's say, now we're wondering, all right, should we change the dimension of this? And how is that going to affect this part? So I can very, very easily come in here, change this measurement to, let's say, one inch and three quarters. Let's change this one to two. I'll rebuild and rerun the study. 
as you do that, Trend Tracker is going to ask you if you want to save the changes or not. And in fact, the, the, the information and parameters that Trend Tracker is recording are going to be sensors that you create in your assembly or in your part body, as you see right here. Okay, it asks you if you want to add these components, if you want to add these, uh, these points in your parameters, and as you do so, you're going to be able to see graphs of how your design is behaving. So let's go ahead and then add one more here. Just hide this guy. And extend this to two inches. Or two and a quarter. And then let that run again. Uh, once again, guys, keep in mind, if you want to ask questions, go ahead and use the Q&A section instead of using the chat. Okay, so um, you can create sensors in both parts and assemblies so that you can actually monitor or have Trend Tracker see just particular entities or faces of interest. You know, you don't necessarily have to be looking at the maximum uh, global uh, global stresses. So let's go ahead and take a look at oh, let's take a look at our graphs that we have now in our patterns. Let's bring them all back. So here I can see that in my three different iterations where I change the dimensions, um, I'm increasing my mass. Naturally, that's happening because the gusset is getting bigger. My maximum stresses, von Mises, are actually decreasing, and my displacement is also decreasing. Right, so I can very quickly uh, decide if I am going the right way. And this is not just for model geometry; it's also for settings in your uh, in your study. You can change your fixturing, you can change um, the material types. It'll record all of that. And once you're ready to accept the one that you want, you can tell it to do so, and select the iteration to restore. And then you'll have the the, um, the winning geometry, essentially. Because who needs to write this down on a piece of paper when we have computers to keep track of it for us, right? Okay, let's go back to... PowerPoint. Okay. So as you saw, simulation standard allows you to study multiple bodies, right? Uh, you can do contacts. Uh, you can control the mesh, mesh refinement. So instead of having a, a coarse mesh like this one right here, which was the same in Simulation Express and Simulation Standard, Simulation Express would need you to increase the entire uh, mesh density of the whole part. This would take longer to calculate. Instead, Simulation Standard allows you to, to add uh, mesh refinement only in areas of interest, just as this hole right here. Okay, this will help you uh, have a lot better performance in your calculations. You can also do contact uh, definition, which allows you to either uh, make two pieces uh, be bonded together or have no penetration so you can get output contact pressures. There's, there's very helpful tools to help you figure out how you set up your study to recognize if faces are bonded together or if there's no penetration. As you see here, we ended up changing from a completely glued face to a more realistic depiction of how the weld would work and then we added no penetration contact. Uh, we have other tools to help you figure out if, you're, if your parts need more constraining. So if you're not sure if there's any degrees of freedom that are left to constrain, you can have this and it'll, it'll use this very user-friendly UI to let you see what you need to constrain. We can also have the ability to, uh, or we have the access to add complex loads. We're not limited to just uh, simple forces and pressures. Right? We're including remote loads here and distributed masses. And we have uh, a lot more advanced set of fixtures. So let's say, um, even if you had a part that had symmetry, you can actually have the calculation time that you're that is taken to study a piece by adding symmetry to it. And of course, this is more granular control for the six degrees of freedom that each component will have. And then Trend Tracker that helps you figure out if the settings and parameters that you're changing are actually heading towards the goal that you're, that you're trying to achieve in your simulation study and your design. 
So let's look at a little bit further into simulation standard. Uh, so we have a case study for this webinar. This is a robotic arm that we're making at uh, GoE. So as we were building it, uh, we realized that we might want to study that main arm that's holding most of the weight. Okay, so to do that, instead of studying the entire piece, we're actually going to go ahead and then make some assumptions, some engineering assumptions, as to what components we can actually move out of the way. If you wanted to try to study the entire assembly, it would take quite a bit of a while, even just for small tweaks and changes, to see if your setup was correct. So the first step in simulation is always going to be to simplify your, um, your assembly and your study. So as I mentioned, uh, here's the arm, and we're going to go ahead and then work on this arm right here, just this particular link, this dog bone. This is actually a three-piece part. You can see on the left, we're actually going to set up no penetration contact in the faces of each one of those components, and we'll utilize um, a bolt fastener to be able to uh, simulate the stresses that happen from that with an existing preload. So here's the arm. It, this is it being halfway built. Uh, what happened is, as we were moving forward, we realized that the, the weight that we kept adding had actually increased a lot more than we expected. And so before we move forward with the rest of it, it was time to pull out simulation and make sure that we were safe or not. So instead of having all of those components, what I'm going to utilize is uh, remote loads and remote masses. What this does is it allows the it allows you to um, to simulate the effect of other components in your study without the necessity of having to match them and then take them in account in your in your calculation. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like in SolidWorks. So this here was the sub-assembly of just that arm, um, that arm linkage with all of the all of the hardware. And what we're going to do for the remote load is in the top level assembly, we just group the entire sub-assembly from that, from uh, this motor forward into one sub-assembly where we've had SolarWorks find the center of mass for us. And so I created these coordinate systems where to put that center load. So let me go ahead and start a new study okay and let's actually begin by removing these two components since I'm going to use a remote load or remote mass um, I want to exclude them from the analysis I'm going to go ahead and select the components actually these two the uh, gearbox there and the motor there and tell them to exclude from the analysis notice that this allows you to get to get those parts out of the analysis, but still keep them in your assembly. Um, for the material, I'm actually going to use a, uh, an ABS, um, a somewhat similar ABS material property that we have for, our for a 3D printed part. Okay, so now we have those three components. If we look at the global contact, it's set to bonded. So if we look at the contact visualization plot, I can see that these are actually bonded together. And well, that's not a fact. Right, these are actually meant to be no penetration. So I'll go ahead and change that. No penetration. And this time I will not add any bonded contacts of my own. Instead, what I'll do is I'll add uh, bolt connectors. So instead of using the actual geometry of a bolt that has to get meshed, and you have to make sure to have a good mesh density on it, I want to use a mathematical approximation of them called the bolt connector. If you just right click the connections option, select bolt, I notice that we have quite a few options here. Bolt with nut, countersink, just a regular screw, countersink screw, and a foundation bolt. Depending on the selection or on the bolt type you want, your selection is going to change. In this case, I'm going to utilize a, a bolt with a nut. So to define those, all I need to do is select the inner face of the hole that's going to be the head, and then the, the, inner, uh, the inner edge the inner edge of the face that's going to represent the nut. I do have a few more options here, like for example, uh, pretension. 
since this is an ABS part I don't want to over tighten it so it's actually just gonna be using an 8 foot pound um, preload. Okay, I'll go ahead and click accept and create the rest of these bolts. Oh, yeah. And then notice that I actually have a couple of nice shortcuts uh, that SolarWorks provides where I'm left clicking, right clicking to go to my next option, left clicking, and right clicking to accept and it just moves over to the next bolt. One of the wonderful things that SolarWorks does quite well is save the clicks and um, save all of the unnecessary motions that you would have to do and each one of these bolts has been set to have 8 foot-pounds of torque. So as you do that, SolarWorks will actually show you a quick preview of that bolt. Now that's just a graphical representation that will be utilized for you to recognize what type of bolt you added. Now since these here are actually uh, fastened um, into the other gearbox, I do not want to do a similar constraint as I did on the bolt where I utilized on cylindrical faces. Instead I want to use on flat faces, since ideally these faces are not going to go anywhere. What I'm going to do is use the ability to control the six degrees of freedom independently by telling it to only lock in place the three translational degrees of freedom. So these are not going to move in the X, Y, and Z, but they're free to actually um, deform uh, rotationally. So that's essentially it. Oh, my bad, I still need to add the remote loads. So for the remote loads, instead of having the motor, I'm going to go ahead and right click my external load here, choose remote load. Now I'm actually going to utilize selection sets. I already have predefined definitions of uh, those faces that I want to use. So I'm going to go ahead and click him here and utilize the coordinate system that I created for the center of mass of this motor. And I know the mass is going to be 2.5 pounds, so I'm going to go ahead and add that here. Okay, so that one's set, and you can see how that's set. This is telling me that that mass is attached to those four holes. Next, um, this mass is no good if there's no gravity. So I'm going to go ahead and enable gravity. As I do, I get a quick preview right there of the direction of gravity. It's going down, so I accept that. And then add one more remote load. I'll go through the same process as I did before using my pre-existing selection sets here. And I'll utilize another coordinate system I created on the center of mass of the other sub-assembly. Okay, and in this case, instead of using a mass, let's go ahead and use a force. So here I can also control the direction of the forces. Now this is going to be this is actually going to be subject to 15 pounds of force and I can of course control the direction as you see right there. Now we're pointing down. All right. So now our study is ready and we can actually uh, run this. Oh, but before that, I do know that the highest concentration of stress is actually found in these faces where the bolts are actually pre-stressed. So I will want to add a mesh control. I'll go ahead and select the faces that I want to add the mesh control on. And give them a particular setting that I want for that. And once I create, uh, well I can control of course the, also the quality of the mesh here. But um, since this takes uh, about 3 minutes and we don't just want to watch the loading bar, I have the results right here. Now it's also very easy to copy your setup from one study to another. Let's say in this case I had set up my bolts in a particular way. I could just click and drag them and then move them over to another existing, stu existing study. This will save you, the, save you the trouble of having to redefine the same thing again and again when you're trying different uh, iterations. So let's go ahead and take a look at the stress found in this, in this arm. So here, you'll be able to see that the maximum stress is actually found in those faces where the bolts are being uh, preloaded. Right? We can see that the arm has actually moved forward a bit. Let's go ahead and then look at an animation of it. So this is in the deformation scale of 1, and in fact, 
I know that the uh, the yield stress of um, this ABS plastic is about 5,000 psi. There it is. 5,076. So I am essentially looking at my max stress being above yield, which means that this arm is not really going to hold out that well, is it? So now I know for sure that this arm is definitely more than just on the verge of failing. And we, could, we were able to very quickly figure that out thanks to simulation standard. So what are we going to do now? Well, fortunately, a simulation standard allows you to run design studies together with your uh, simulation studies. So what we're going to do here is if you see these faces highlighted in, uh, in blue and uh, yellow-ish, what we're going to do is we're going to add a, an equation, I'm oh, sorry, a global variable to control the thickness of this arm. We're going to set up a, sim a um, design study so that SolarWorks can go ahead and then change those different combinations, make different permutations, and evaluate them all. So what we're going to have the freedom to do is select those particular variables, tell them what the minimum and maximum ranges are, and add a, an incremental step. And we can also have it um, have an overview of particular stresses that we're going to find on this part. So in this case, what we want to do is we're going to set a, a factor of safety a sensor just to see what it is. But as the simulations are running, it's going to let me know, it's going to notify me if my stresses are going to be less than 4300 PSI and if my displacements are less than half an inch. The reason for this is because I want to I want to know if there's going to be one combination that is going to be able to withstand uh, about 85% of the yield. As the simulation runs, it's going to start giving me this output of the table where red naturally tells me that it's going to fail and white means that it's actually gone past my acceptance criteria. Let's go ahead and take a look at this in SolarWorks. So you can link uh, design studies not just to simulation but just about anything um, any value that you have available in in SolarWorks so this is not limited to just um, one sec this is not limited to just simulation this is something that you can actually do uh, just with CAD Okay, so to set this up, what I did was I created an equation. Sorry, I created a global variable, well, two of them actually, and I linked them to existing features on this arm. The result of that allowed me to create a design study. Oh, here, let's go through how to create that. Okay, so to create a design study, I'm going to go to evaluate, design study. And here I'm going to have the different parameters that I created. I want to choose. I want to choose to control the width of this part, which is the variable that I created and linked. Minimum is going to be zero. Maximum is going to be 0.3. This is just going to be an increment to the already existing geometry, okay? And a step of 0.1. As I add another variable, I'm going to go over to 0.3 as well. And in this case, I know that the 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 offset on the right side and on the front can only go up to 0.3 just because it would start interfering with other components while it's in motion. Now, as I start changing these values, you'll see that we actually have uh, the amount of iterations here that, that we'll have to go through. It essentially calculates those permutations. I have the option of either using ranges with increment steps or putting a discrete value, meaning that I can just put the, the actual numbers that I wanted to test. 
let's go ahead and stay there okay then here for constraints I've created sensors for the uh, for, so that I can just monitor the mini the minimum factor of safety I just want to see what it is for each one of the results and I have two more sensors to monitor the overall displacement of the part in this case I only wanted to show me or to tell me if anything is displacing less than 0.5 and if any of these stresses are less than 4500 so I am at 85 percent of yield on this part then I'll just click run and then it'll go through now I do have a couple of options where if I want to get each one of those studies run on their own I click high quality or fast results where it'll be it'll be super fast because it'll just create inter it'll just grab certain uh, milestones and create an interpolation of the results when I find the one that I like uh, that's the one I, I decide to run on its own now I do have a finished set of design studies here naturally this is going to take a little bit longer uh, than just running one single study so in my results I could see that it's incrementing those different dimensions now over here on scenario 12 I actually have the maximum size of of, uh, of all of them Oh, lucky me I don't have values there <laughs> well as you click through the different scenarios you'll notice that the actual geometry changes so it keeps track of those different dimensional values so you can evaluate which is the one that you want uh, in, the, in this case I guess you'll have to take my word for it let's see ah. all too bad what I, could, what I was able to see here was the further scenarios where the part was actually thicker it did not actually meet my criteria so there there is a particular set of uh, parameters that will achieve that stiffness that I want and it's not just by beefing it up uh, at the most so once I click the scenario 8 it brings in those values and then I can go ahead and run a study rerun the existing study that I have with those with those new dimensions and then see the resulting stresses And so in this case, with those new dimensions, I am no longer at a maximum stress of, of 5,000 PSI. I've actually, I've actually managed to lower my maximum uh, stress to 43 or 4,400 PSI, you know, which is uh, quite a bit safer by adding material to just one side, well, adding a particular amount of material to, uh, to those two parameters that I told it to control. So great, this is not going to yield. So now what? how many times is this going to operate? I mean, I, have, I don't have a safety factor of about uh, 8 that tends to be common for, for uh, to take into account for fatigue. So let's go ahead and go back here. So simulation standard actually allows you to study fatigue analysis. So we have two types of amplitudes that you can do with simulation standard. We offer quite a, a bit more of a variety with the further uh, licensing of simulation. Uh, we have constant amplitude and variable amplitude, where you can actually input, uh, let's say, a set of data, a set of data sets that you have obtained from an accelerometer, and then determine how many times you can go through those cycles. So the options that we have is we can study a fully reverse scenario, where we're actually putting our part to a positive stress and a negative stress from the studies that we've created zero based which go from full relaxation to a positive stress and loading ratio where you can actually control the mean stress ratio of this curve and we we also do have cycle peaks which is for a more custom uh, study of different scenarios you can actually have multiple static study stresses to be taken in account in one fatigue study to see how long it would last so let's go ahead and take a look at that at this in uh, SOLIDWORKS Let's go ahead and close this guy Okay So this here is the same, it's a copy of the same static study that you just saw with those particular dimensions that we got from the um, design study.
right? This is what is going to be able to handle um, more than 85% of yield. Oh, sorry, more, less than, it's going to be able to, it's giving us a top stress that's less than 85% of yield. So to create a fatigue study, I'll just click new study, fatigue, these are the two that are available with simulation standard. I'll just utilize the sinus, the um, harmonic fatigue or sinus, sinusoidal constant amplitude fatigue. So what I'll do here is I'll add an event. Now, fatigue, psych, fatigue analysis in SOLIDWORKS is actually for high cycle fatigues. That means 10,000 cycles and up. Uh, but let me just go ahead and run it for 10,000 cycles. And in my case, uh, this is going to be going um, back and forth through through uh, the different stresses. In case I forget what each one of these definitions are, uh, there's a very nice um, help post here that actually helps you remember that quite easily. So I'm going to go ahead and then use my fully reversed and choose my existing uh, results for the static study. You can even increase the scale of them if you're, if you're trying to add even more safety factors to it. Once I click accept, now I just have to define my material. So this is where the most important aspect of simulation comes in. You must have accurate data for your material properties to be able to get accurate, accurate study results. In this case, I ended up adding this, this, uh, this curve myself. Uh, it took quite a bit of searching, but SolarWorks does actually allow you, or sorry, does come in with some stress strain curves and, uh, and SN curves for fatigue. In, their, in the default materials here. If we click on file right there, this will actually take you to all of the different curves that are available. Not every material has it, but at least this is a good, this is a good uh, milestone point where to start uh, using fatigue with. If you want to make sure that you have an accurate study, you want to get that information from your manufacturer or even send samples to have tested for, uh, for your, fatigue, uh, your fatigue curves. Uh, once, this, once this is added, uh, depending on the, um, on the amount of data that you have, we actually use certain types of interpolation depending on where your noise is found. Right? In this case, I have a good set of data, so I'm just going to stay in log log. So once I do that and I've set my event, I also have the ability to um, add some mean stress correction. If you guys recall from, uh, from school, the most common ones, uh, Gerber and Goodman, are right there. Right. And I'll just tell it to go ahead and run, and it'll it'll go ahead and do the constant amplitude fatigue study by utilizing the stress results found in this study, which is the output of the design study. All right, and so fatigue studies are actually not that uh, they don't take as long to run as uh, static studies. But here we're going to get, okay, so we're going to get a couple of uh, plots. First, a damage plot. Now, this is a damage percentage, taking into account that we run this for 10,000 cycles. I'll set this to 100 because that's really uh, what, I, what I really care about. If I look up close, I can see that that area where those bolts are actually um, pre-stressed with the, with the, with the preload, um, are going to be the areas of failure. In fact, what fatigue studies allows me to do is not just see where the failure would happen, which we can all we can all definitely uh, say that it's going to be where the high stresses are found, but also um, give us an idea of what is the likelihood of a crack to start propagating in that area. Now, in this case, if you're familiar with stress singularities in FEA, this is going to be a very important uh, a, a very important topic for you to understand uh, to know if an area. Uh, that's showing a very uh, short life is due to a singularity or actually a stress concentration. So here, once this becomes our, uh, so if this is our um, our part that we end up making, then we know that we want to pay attention to these certain regions for for fatigue failure, even though we know it's not going to yield. Now. What the percentage here doesn't mean that it's definitely going to going to fail there. That's going to be com um, controlled quite a bit by the by the correction that we selected uh, but this is going to give us an idea right if of how likely it is to fail for the amount of cycles that we told it to so at 10,000 cycles 
I know that I don't I should not have confidence on this lasting so long this area right there if I look at my next plot a life plot this is going to also be highly dependent on the uh, curve that you provided to the material what I can see here is just about every every piece here is going to last up to the maximum that the curve that I gave it is but I can get an approximate life cycle for those areas of interest so according to this taking into account a good man correction this is going to last about 4200 cycles where those bolts are getting stressed okay so now I know that this I know that this is quite a bit of a it's not it's not necessarily as long as life cycle as I want but we are prototyping this arm so what this is telling me is well what this helped us do is come up with the decision that we're going to utilize the same arm finish assembling the assembling the robotic arm and start studying and, uh, and programming the inverse kinematics on this thing meanwhile while they're actually working on the programming I will go ahead and then figure out what is a better design for this arm to not only re to not only reduce uh, the stresses on it but also to take into account frequency uh, resonant frequencies okay, and stiffness and torsion so what I what I have been able to do right there is reduce the development time because if I did not know if this was safe or not I would have had to wait until I recreated this component and then assemble the whole arm instead we know this is safe for about 42 cycles 4200 cycles um, which is going to be when we'll be checking for for uh, cracks but by then I'm sure we'll have a more robust and more rigid um, linkage that we'll just replace it by So, the takeaways. Um, you guys, if you guys have Simulation Standard, go ahead and uh, go ahead and use Simulation Express. It's there. It's free. Make sure you get the most out of your money. Now, if you're trying to do anything the Simulation Express cannot handle, like multiple components or reaction forces, um, in that case, you will have to use Simulation Standard, uh, which is the lowest, the, it's the lower tier of the Simulation Suite uh, that we provide for SolarWorks. That's essentially the end of the presentation.